including the King Jesus Trilogy, which starts with Cleopatra to Christ, then King Jesus, and Jesus, King of Edessa. That's the book that I have here. According to Ralph Ellis, this is the book that the Catholic Church has been dreading for the last 1,700 years. It's also the book that may end Christianity as we know it. We've already brought down one Pope, Ralph. <clears throat> See, what happened was Ralph sent over a review copy over to the Vatican. And, and he went straight away, yes. Within a couple of weeks, he had to resign. <laughs> So now, because of Ralph, we have the first Jesuit Pope. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Ralph. The Gospel according to Ralph Ellis. It's certainly an unorthodox approach to Christianity. Yeah, well, sort of. Uh, the thing I like about it is that it makes a darn sight more sense than the other Gospels do. It doesn't change the story that much, but... The whole thing that started me on, on this uh, crusade was the fact that all these characters from the Bible are missing from the historical record. You know, whether it's the Old Testament and we, you know, we start with, uh, you know, Abraham and Jacob and Joseph uh, all the way through to King David and King Solomon. They're all missing from the historical record. Or whether we come into the New Testament and Jesus, Saul or St. Paul, who, you know, the most famous people in the last 2,000 years. And they're all missing from the historical record. And that just struck me as being bizarre. You know, it, it, you've only got really two options here. Either the whole of this is, is fictional, it's all make-belief, and that's why these people cannot be found, found in the historical record. Now, when you say these people, who are you? Yeah, these, these very, very famous characters. You know, King, well, even in, as it were, recent history, you know, King David and King Solomon, you know, they were the richest, most powerful, most famous kings of that era, you know, circa 950 BC or whatever. And yet they're totally missing from the historical record. There is no basis for them being in Jerusalem in that era. You know, the, the major uh, archaeological digs uh, by Finkelstein and Silberman have concluded that Jerusalem was no more than a village in that era. So how can you have these, you know, really famous fabulously wealthy kings that are not in the historical record. The same happens all the way through the Bible. Up well, what about Jesus Christ? Is he... Well, precisely. He's not in the historical record either. Antiquities of the Jews, books 18 and 20. Yeah, but that's the... You're talking about the uh, Testimonium Flavium, yeah. uh, which everybody considers to be um, an interpolation. It's false. It's a fraud. It was put into the books of Josephus by Eusebius, because all of the historians, the biblical historians, the theologians before Eusebius, make no mention of it whatsoever. So we know that's an interpolation, it's a fraud. So within the text of Josephus, there is no mention of Jesus. He's just not there. That's a problem for Christianity, because Josephus wrote a complete history of first century Judea. And, you know, Jesus and Saul were fairly famous people in that era. You know, they caused a bit of a kerfuffle in Judea. He would have mentioned it somewhere within his books. And he doesn't. So we've got this problem again. Either the whole of the New Testament is fictional and the guy didn't exist, or we're looking perhaps in the wrong era for him or under the wrong name for him. So he's there, but we just haven't identified who he is. I think it's a bit of the former, actually. We're, we're actually looking in the wrong era for Jesus. None of this makes sense. You cannot find Jesus if you look in the AD 30s, you know, for the traditional sort of uh, ministry of Jesus, which is like AD 30 to AD 33. It just doesn't exist. However, there is a very famous Jesus who was active in the AD 60s, and he is Jesus of Gamala. And it just so happens that the history of Jesus of Gamala is, in many respects, identical to the biblical Jesus. I discovered this about 15, 18 years ago or more, uh, in one of my first books, which was Jesus, Last of the Pharaohs. And I didn't actually discover that, first of all. What I actually discovered was the identity of Saul. Saul is St. Paul, of course. And he's another of these 
very famous characters who is missing from the historical record. Remember, Saul is probably more famous than Jesus, actually, because Christianity was created by Saul. Uh, I'm not sure if your listeners are aware, but Christianity has nothing to do with the Church of Jesus whatsoever. Oh, do explain. <laughs> this is a common fallacy. You've fallacy. got a lot of explaining to do, Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it's a common fallacy within uh, Christianity that their religion is based on Jesus. It's not. It's actually based on the religion of Saul. Most people regard the hero of Christianity as being Christ Jesus, which means King Jesus, as if all of the New Testament was based on his teachings and, and Christianity was based on his teachings. It's not. It was created by Saul. And Saul was Jesus' worst enemy. If you remember from Acts, you know, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And there were two distinct churches in that era. There was the church of Jesus and James, his brother James, and there was the church of Saul. And they were very different. The church of Jesus was a Judaic church. It was a Nazarene Judaic church. You had to be a Jew to be a part of it. You had to be circumcised. You had to conform with Judaic law, Mosaic law. The church of Saul was totally the opposite. He hated circumcision. In fact, there was this big battle of circumcision where Saul refused. And in fact, he, he mocked the church of Jesus for being the circumcised. And he, he then said, what did he say? He said, uh, if the church of Jesus likes circumcision so much, they may as well cut off their entire penis and have done with it. And that's, I think it's in Galatians. I'll, I'll get you a quote later for that one. So you can see there was this big difference between the Church of Saul and the Church of Jesus. The Church of Saul was a Rome-friendly, uh, simple Judaism, I call it, because you didn't have to conform to Mosaic law. That was the big difference. He said, you don't need Mosaic law, you can have faith instead. And so it was an entirely different church. And Christianity came from the Church of Saul. So it has nothing to do with the Church of Jesus. Saul is perhaps the most famous character in the last 2,000 years. He is the guy who created Christianity, and he is also missing from the historical record. He was the first character I went looking for, and I found a substitute character, a very similar character, surprisingly enough, uh, by the name of Josephus, Josephus Flavius, this is a historian. And it just so happens that the life of Saul and the life of Josephus are incredibly similar. I won't go through all the various um, similarities. You know, readers, listeners will have to look it up in my book. But one of the ones I do like was they were both uh, sent to Rome on a prison ship. They were both shipwrecked, landed on Malta, and then were taken later by boat to Naples and went to see the emperor, who was Nero, of course. How many prison ships get shipwrecked with characters who are very, very similar upon them? You know, either Saul and Josephus were on the same ship, or they are the same person. And it's my contention that they are the same person. When did people start worshipping Jesus Christ? Well, this was a creation by Saul Josephus, this combined character, because... If you know that Saul is Josephus, this changes the story somewhat. The most basic change it makes is it could not have happened in the AD 30s. This is what I was getting back to. It cannot be an AD 30 story because Saul was only, sorry, Josephus was only born in AD 37. It has to be an AD 60s story. And so if you're going to find all these characters in the historical record, you've got to start looking into the AD 60s, and it is there that we find them. And it also changes the rationale behind why this story was written. Because, as I said before, it wasn't written by Jesus and James, it was written by their enemy, who was Saul Josephus. And in both Saul and in Josephus, we find a character who is extremely Rome-friendly. Josephus, just for people who don't know, became the pet historian and propaganda expert of Emperor Vespasian. He was like Vespasian's number two in, in Judea. He was Jewish as well. Yeah, he was Jewish. He, he, was, a, he was a Jewish turncoat, basically. He was a, an army commander. He was a sort of aristocrat to start with. Then he became a Jewish army commander fighting 
uh, the Romans. And then he changed sides again, a little bit like Saul. He had a flash of inspiration on the, on the road to Galilee. And he changed sides and he became a Roman army commander, effectively. For I was blind and now I see. This is Saul, right? Yeah. Um, yes, that's right. He had a flash of inspiration on, on the road to Damascus. Well, uh, Josephus had a flash of inspiration on the road to Tarichi, it was, I think. Uh, anyway, there was um, a place where he was uh, army commander and he got captured. And anyway, he had a flash of inspiration and he turned into a Roman commander and propaganda expert. So, again, the two very, very similar characters. The Goebbels of... Absolutely. He was, he was, he was the Goebbels of, of that uh, era, and he was putting out propaganda. And, of course, one of the propaganda books he put out was the New Testament. Well, the New Testament, as we know, is a collection of books. It's a collection of books, but where did the information come from? You see, one of the things that I didn't start off looking at, but one of the sort of things that became apparent when I was sort of looking through all of the information it gives and comparing it with Josephus is, A, there's a lot of the information is directly comparable with the stories given by Josephus in his secular books, especially if you look in Luke and Acts. There are a lot of very obvious similarities between the two. And so whoever was writing the New Testament, and I tend to think that Josephus was responsible for Luke and Acts, but who, whoever was writing the other books was influenced by Josephus as a propaganda expert who was working for the Romans. And that's why we see the New Testament is a very Rome-friendly book. It places the, you know, the blame for everything is placed upon the Jews. And Christians are supposed to be full of peace and love, and, and the Romans were wonderful people, really, honest. And even Pontius Pilate. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't to blame, you know, it, it was all the Jews, you know. So you, you can see where this propaganda is coming from. Uh, Rome had a problem on its eastern borders, you know, the Jews were not very good Romans. Rome had been everywhere around Europe, around the Mediterranean, and it had subjugated populations and made them Roman. And Rome was quite egalitarian in a way. You were allowed to worship whatever god you wanted and, you know, have whatever traditions you wanted, as long as you were Rome first, you were a Roman first, and you, as it were, worshipped the emperor first. And anything else you did was up to you. That was no problem. The only people who wouldn't do this was the Jews. And they wouldn't eat with Romans, they wouldn't bathe with Romans, they wouldn't sleep with Romans, they wouldn't pray with Romans. They were just not very good Romans. And, and then to cap it all, they kept having disputes on the eastern borders of the Roman Empire, which included the great Jewish revolt of AD 68 to AD 70. So they weren't very good Romans. And what Rome wanted to do was convert these Jews into something that was a little bit more Roman. And, of course, Christianity gave them exactly that. It was a Roman form of Judaism. It was Judaism for Gentiles. It allowed Rome to have a Judaic-type religion, which would water down the more aggressive Orthodox Judaism that was on their eastern borders. It was perfect. And uh, the Jews were a problem. You know, They were causing problems on the eastern borders of the empire. And Rome wanted to quell that. And that's exactly what they managed to do. And it was propaganda, basically. So Josephus was a very competent historian, uh, although not above amending the history if it suited him, of course. So he wrote a complete history of first century Judea. But for the Romans, he also wrote a sort of sugar-coated history of first century Judea which we would call the New Testament. So this was a story about a specific event within the first century, which was the Jewish revolt. The Jewish revolt was the major event of the first century in the whole of the Roman Empire, really. This was a major revolt where uh, all of Judea was destroyed. All of Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. Every Jew was exiled from Jerusalem. No Jews were allowed in Jerusalem whatsoever. It became a Roman city. So this was a huge tragedy for the Jews, of course. Every single Jew was pretty much exiled from Judea, which is why we have the, the exiled Jews all around Europe today. That is a direct consequence of the Jewish revolt of AD 70, because the Romans ejected them from Judea. They 
took them into slavery and they, they exiled them all over the empire. So this was a, a major event in the first century and the Romans didn't want it to happen again. And so Josephus, who was their you know, primary propaganda expert, who was Saul, of course, sought to reduce that rebellious nature on the eastern borders by producing this new Judaism for Gentiles. And so if we understand that, then all of the characters within the New Testament should be visible within the Jewish revolt, within this AD 70s era. And it just so happens the biblical story is a story about Saul chasing Jesus around Galilee. Saul, Saul, why, why are you persecuting me? And Josephus' story, his, his history of Judea, is about Josephus chasing, in a very similar fashion, chasing a guy around Galilee. And this guy just happens to be called Jesus, of course, Jesus of Gamala. So it's the same story. It's, you know, one is a secular story and one is a sort of uh, spiritual story with fairy dust all over it. Who is Jesus Christ? Is he the son of Mary and Joseph? Yes, probably, although they didn't necessarily go by those names. There have been some amendments to some of the names. Mary, for instance, just means priest or bishop in the Syriac. So that was probably her title rather than her name. Her, her real name was uh, Shalmath, according to the Syriacs. Was he a son of God? Well, that would, came from the Egyptian heritage. Uh, you've got to remember in my first book on this trilogy, Cleopatra to Christ, I traced the heritage of Jesus back to Queen Cleopatra. So he was of Egyptian extract. That's why in both Saul's work in Acts and in Josephus' works in, in Jewish wars, he's identified as the Egyptian false prophet because he had an Egyptian history and that was understood in that era. And we know he was the Egyptian false prophet because the Egyptian false prophet took the 5,000 out into the wilderness, exactly the same as Jesus. And the Egyptian false prophet also had an armed uprising on the Mount of Olives, exactly the same as Jesus, etc. So we knew he had a, an Egyptian heritage. And you've got to remember, within Egypt, any of the pharaohs of Egypt, the kings of Egypt, were always the sons of a god whether it's Tuth Moses or Ra Moses or Ar Moses, they're all sons of an Egyptian god or other. So this was just a, a very normal title to be a son of God. And so in, in the same tradition, of course he would have been a son of God in the same tradition. You, I mean, you can take that any way you like. Where do you get off the rails? The Gospel according to Matthew starts with the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Yeah, but we know that's wrong because... A, there's two gene genealogies, and they're totally different to each other. B, he cannot be the son of God if, if he has a genealogy that goes through his uh, patriarchal line, because if Joseph was not his father, then, God, then, then his genealogy is irrelevant. And, it, that, I mean, that's a question that Christians can never answer. You know, they'll say he's the son of God, and then they'll say he's descended from David. Well, sorry, <laughs> you can't have both. But that's not really what it was based on. It was based on the original titles of the pharaohs of Egypt, who were all sons of God, one God or another. And that's where the title came from. So there's a lot of these things which seem to be fundamental to Christianity, which are quite incidental and, and totally irrelevant in some respects. I mean, things like, you know, turning the water into wine. You know, this is the great miracle that proves that Jesus was divine, you know. And then if you read the history of the first century, you will find that the chief engineer and mathematician of that era, who was hero of Alexandria, he, he was like a, a Leonardo da Vinci of the first century. And hero of Alexandria made all sorts of wonderful contraptions. He made a, a jet engine, as it were, a jet turbine in the first century, uh, or a steam turbine, I should say. But one of the favorite things he liked to do, and he made about 12 of these different things, was to turn water into wine. So what he did is he, he was a great engineer, and he made trick wine jugs that would 
turn water into wine. And everybody knows about this who's a historian, and yet no historian, to my knowledge, has ever dared suggest that this is exactly what Jesus had. He had one of Hero of Alexandria's trick jugs. Parlor tricks. Yeah, the parlor tricks. They, they, they had compartments within the jug. So it was a normal jug. It looked like a, a jug, but it had compartments in there which were controlled by finger pressure on, on the handle. And so you could turn water into wine. You could pour out water for one person and wine for another person. And this is a well-known parlor trick in this area. He used to design these for the great and the good of the first century i.e. the kings and the aristocrats, which is exactly what Jesus was. There is no miracles here. This is all perfectly explainable. And yet it undermines almost everything that, that Christianity hangs its hat on. Uh, explain the importance of Edessa. I had never heard of Edessa before this book. Yeah, and you've got to ask yourself, why haven't you heard of Edessa? It was very famous in the first century. The kings of Edessa saved Jerusalem from starvation in AD 47 or whatever. Uh, the queen of Edessa, she bought the, the gold candelabra, the menorah, for the Temple of Jerusalem. The king of Edessa is even mentioned in, in the Book of Acts. He's called uh, Agabus in, in the Book of Acts. They were quite famous people. The, the, there's this ap apocryphal gospel of Agabus sending letters to Jesus. That's quite a well-known apocryphal gospel. So he was very famous in this era, very influential. And if you follow the story that Josephus gives, it was actually the kings of Edessa who started the Jewish revolt against Rome. This is in AD 68. Josephus says that the royal family who started the Jewish revolt that ended in the destruction of Jerusalem was King Monobazus and King Izates of Adiabani, who you've probably not heard of either, but there we go. However, when I went into Syria, northern Syria, I suddenly discovered that the great tradition in northern Syria is that these kings, Monobazus and Izates, the queen of Adiabani, of these kings, was Queen Helena, and she was married, she was the chief wife of King Agbaras of Edessa. So what we have here is, is, if you read the books of Josephus, we have this very powerful monarchy who was said to be beyond the Euphrates, you know, heading out into Iraq somewhere who started the Jewish revolt. But you cannot find these people in the historical record. Again, you know, we have all these wonderful famous characters who are missing in the historical record. And nobody really knows who these monarchs were or where, where Adiabani was. It's all a bit sort of mythical. But the Syriacs say that Adiabani was actually Edessa. And King Monobazus and King Izates was actually King Agbarus and King Manu of Edessa. So, again, what Josephus has done is to create a, a slightly fictional royal family based upon the royal family of Edessa. If you start mixing that royal family together, if you class them as being one and the same royal family, because remember, Edessa is beyond the Euphrates, suddenly it all starts to make sense. What Josephus has done is, again, to put us off the scent, he has created pseudonyms for these people. And they're fairly simple pseudonyms. So we can trace them back and we can see that he was actually talking about Edessa. For instance, one of the kings of Edessa was called King Manu. And if you look at the name he gives, which is Monobazus, or Manu Bazus, that name in the Greek is actually King Manu. So again, you can see that these two monarchies were actually the same monarchy. Now we can start relating this back to the events of Judea and the New Testament, because this king, king, well, 
the original king was uh, King Agbarus, but he died in AD 50, so it would have been his sons, King Manu. There were two Manus, King Manu the fifth and King Manu the sixth, were the people who started the Jewish revolt. Now, if you remember back to what we were talking uh, about before, about... It's starting to tie in a little bit. Yeah, about Jesus of Gamala. Again, Jesus of Gamala is another of these semi-fictional people, because although he's mentioned a lot in the works of Josephus, we've got no idea who he is. You know, there is no statue saying this is Jesus of Gamala. He's just a character within the works of Josephus. But of course, suddenly we start to find that Jesus of Gamala and Jesus of Adiabani have the same name and the same history. They both come from beyond the Euphrates. Jesus of Adiabani was also called Jesus of Kama, Jesus of Gamala. Again, there are lots of synergies between them. What? And, and of course, Jesus of Gamala was the leader of the Jewish revolt. But Jesus of Adiabani was also the leader of the Jewish revolt. And in Islam, Jesus is Isa. Isa, yeah, that's right. Has, has the same name. So what we start to find is these two people who were both the leader of the Jewish revolt are actually one person, of course. So Jesus is actually Jesus. And that was his original name. So rather than the traditional explanation we always get, which is that Jesus comes from Joshua, you know, the Aramaic or uh, Hebrew word name jo Joshua, it actually comes from an Eastern name, a Syriac name, which was Isis, which is why, in, as you said, in, in uh, Arabic, his name is Isa. If we link Jesus, Isis, and now the kings of Edessa, we're beginning to find out who this guy really was. And suddenly you, you find this new monarchy, which I knew nothing about, you know, same as yourself. And you're saying, you know, Edessa who? What? And I think most listeners are probably saying Edessa who as well, you know, Ed, 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 Ed what? I'd never heard of them before. Yeah. They were Persians. But they weren't simply Persians. They were Egypto-Persians. They were half Egyptian. Uh, the queen had lived in, in Persia for many decades and then they were kicked out of Persia and ended up in Edessa and Edessa again for listeners you won't know where it is so um, north of Aleppo I suppose north of what is currently Syria is actually in Turkey at present it's called San Lurfa but if you go sort of north of Aleppo and it used to be Syria in this uh, era uh, you will come to what is Edessa. It's now called San Lurfa. And there's a wide valley there which became the sort of kingdom of Edessa. Um, it encompassed Edessa, Armida, which is now Diyarbakir, which is sort of east of it, all the way down as far as Palmyra. So there was a, a sort of rectangle of land about, I don't know what it is, it's about... Uh, 200 by 300 kilometers or something, uh, uh, it's quite a large rectangle. So it was a small little kingdom based in northern Syria. These are well-established places. Yes, but only well-established in the first century. You, you see, I, I started this investigation by looking at, at Palmyra because I thought that was their primary city. And Palmyra only suddenly grew in the first century A.D., it was no more than a village before that, and suddenly it became not just a city, it became one of the biggest cities in the Roman Empire. I mean, this was a city that could afford one of the biggest temples in, in the uh, Roman Empire, but also a temple, I've never seen this before. Uh, it's a standard sort of, you know, uh, Greek-looking temple with all the pillars around the outside, and same as you would get anywhere. It looks a bit like the Parthenon sort of thing. Um, the capstone's on the top of the pillars are not stone. They were made of bronze. Now, bronze was incredibly expensive in those days, and someone put bronze capitals on the top, the capstones on the top of the pillars. It must have been phenomenally expensive. And yet this city suddenly grew out of the desert in the first century. And nobody quite knows why or how. But the answer seemed to me quite obvious, because this particular royal family, the Edessan royal family, 
who now I've traced to Edessa more than Palmyra. Why did this uh, little village suddenly grow in, into you know, the biggest city in the, in the Roman Empire almost? It's because there was a royal family came out of Parthia, out of Persia. They were kicked out of Persia in, let's say, about AD 4. So here in AD 4, we had a royal family in a state of some poverty on a journey something to do with taxation because this this uh, a lot of this ended up as a tax dispute um, on the eastern borders of Judea and Syria and this was a royal family who would have been visited by the Magi of course because that was one of always the strangest things about the the nativity scene was why would the Magi, these were the, you know, the three wise men. Why would the Magi be interested in the birth of Jesus? Because the Magi were the Persian priesthood. Why would they be interested in a Judaic birth of, of, of some nomadic travelers in, in the early part of the first century? Well, of course, with this particular family, this royal family who was kicked out of Persia, of course they would be interested in a birth of, of this royal family because this particular royal family had fallen foul of the regime but their son their newly born son would have been a prince of Persia and so of course they would have been interested in any birth of this particular royal family who had just been exiled from Persia and were now somewhere on the eastern borders of Syria this is the nativity scene and if these people had gone to Palmyra, as I think they did, this is the reason why Palmyra suddenly blossomed into being, you know, the richest sort of city in the, in the uh, Eastern Roman Empire. Because of the wealth from Helena. Yeah, because initially uh, the description seemed to be that they were just kicked out of Persia. But they came out of Persia with 200 courtiers and, and 600 armored cavalry. So... They didn't just get kicked out, obviously. They came out with some substantial wealth. So what if, along with the courtiers and the cavalry, they also took most of the Parthian treasury? Well, now you have the funds to actually build a new city. And that is, I think, what happened when this particular queen, and this queen was called Queen Orania. In, in Joseph, she's called Thea Musa Orania. And she was a queen of Egyptian origins who had been given to the uh, Parthian king as a diplomatic bride by Emperor Augustus. And uh, eventually she and her son were kicked out of, of Parthia. Uh, and they formed this new city-state, which I've now placed in Edessa, but originally I placed it in uh, Palmyra. And of course their city-state became known as the Kingdom of Orania. And in fact, the southern part of it is still called um, the Haran even now, or, which comes from Orania. And of course, if you translate the Kingdom of Orania back into English, it is actually the Kingdom of Heaven. So again, you see that, you know, some of the what they recorded in the New Testament may be real history, but you've only got to tweak it a little bit to make it something really wonderful and spiritual. So their kingdom was called the kingdom of heaven because her name was Orania, which means heaven. Of course, they lived in the kingdom of heaven. So when Jesus was down in Judea and he was saying his father lived in the kingdom of heaven, well, of course he did. He lived in Orania, which is northern Syria. It was called the kingdom of heaven. So, um, yeah. I well, this is mind-blowing. Uh, the, cr <laughs> the crown of thorns. Right on the cover of the book, it has a picture of Jesus uh, wearing a crown of thorns. It's really cool. I mean. It is. It's not what readers would expect. So we, we come back to this royal family, um, who I've now identified as not being the Adiabeni royal family, but the Edessan royal family, because they are one and the same. And so I had to investigate this particular royal family, who I knew nothing about until then. And it just so happens that one of their kings, the king of the AD 
1960s, which is the era we're interested in, was called King Manu. But of course, if we go back into the, um, uh, into the New Testament, we find that the main uh, oracle, the main prediction for Jesus himself, was that Jesus would be called Emmanuel, which he never was. Yeah, and so, you read it, and it's, wait a second, he's not he, called he, Emmanuel he, at all, <laughs> he's called Jesus, what's going on? Yeah, um, so the main prediction that they made um, was totally ignored, because his parents called him Jesus instead. So why do we have this verse, which is so important, you know, this was the fundamental thing that made him the Messiah, that he would be called Emmanuel. Well, this, I believe, is, is simply Pasha. Pasha within Judaism is a way of making predictions for the future by using past events within the Old Testament. So you choose a verse in the Old Testament which has some similarity to what's happening uh, in your current world, and you use that as a prediction for what will happen in the current world. And the verse they chose was that Jesus would be called Emmanuel, and of course he wasn't. But what they've done with this Pasha is to use it to conceal his true name. So they've used it as, as a, a way of cake, uh, making an intrigue um, to keep some secret information that other people would not know about. Because he was called Emmanuel. Because the name Emmanuel can be split into three portions, E, Manu, L, and that's how it's actually delineated in the New Testament. And of course the central portion of that name is Manu, and the king of Edessa was called Manu. So Jesus had the same name as the king of Edessa, twice, because he was called Esus, and the Edessan king was called Esus. And then he was called Emmanuel, or Manu, and the Edessan king was called Manu. So they had the same names, the same titles. They end up, these two princes, these two kings, because remember Jesus was a king, he was the king of the Jews. He was the Christ, Christ just means king, um, the anointed one, the king. They both had the same name. And then, if you go and have a look at some of the coins, because we now have coins of this particular king. So we actually have coins with the image of Jesus. You will note that all of the kings of Edessa, all the way from Abgarus, their father, all the way through to the, you know, the beginning of the third century, all of the kings of the Edessa wore a crown of thorns. And that sort of made my ears prick up a little bit when I saw that, as it probably did yours as well. But it's not exactly what listeners might expect. It's not what you would have thought of as a crown of thorns, I presume. No, it's a helmet. It's a helmet, yes. If you can imagine some sort of uh, old-fashioned soldier's helmet, which you know sticks up quite proud upon the head, and then it's covered in thorns. And you might think it's a rather strange crown to have, actually. But this is probably why the, the Romans and the Jews of first century Judea mocked it and, and actually had him sitting on the cross with this crown on his head because it probably did look a bit strange to them. And that's where we get the description in, in the New Testament of Jesus being on the cross and wearing his crown of thorns um, because that was the ceremonial crown of the Edessan kings. The history of, of this particular crown is unknown, but because of these links back to the New Testament and, and to all of the other books I've written on this subject. I was able to trace where this particular crown came from. And just off radio there, we were talking about Delphi, because I'm in Delphi at present in Greece. And, of course, the central artifact, I suppose, in Delphi is the great Omphalos, the great naval stone of the universe. And I'm not sure, again, if listeners have seen it before, but it's a sort of dome-shaped stone covered in nets, which sort of look like seashells or something. And that was the sacred stone of Delphi, of Greece, for a long, long time. And we, we, we're talking before Alexander the Great here. This was a stone that was taken to Syria and beyond because it's within all of the coins of Greek 
Persia, when, when Persia was Greek, of course, under the Seleucids. It's on all of their coins. So this was one of the great artifacts of Greek, Syriac, Persian culture at that time. And it just happens to look exactly the same as the crown of the Edessan kings. So what I think the Edessan kings had was the Omphalos stone on their head, basically, a copy of. Obviously not the real one, it would be rather too heavy. Um, so they, they've just mimicked the Omphalos stone, and that is what they are wearing on their heads. This Omphalos stone is, is then covered in thorns as well. So just to recap, because some of this has been perhaps a little bit uh, complex, what the original New Testament was, was a description, a history of the Jewish revolt. But it's a history of the Jewish revolt that had fairy dust scattered on top of it by Saul Josephus. The, the victors always write the history, and that's exactly what they did. They wrote this, this history, which suited their purposes. But what they did as, as a part of this uh, rewriting of this history was they deleted the real people who actually started the revolt. So the actual leaders of the revolt, they have deleted from history. Who knows today of the royal family of Edessa? Nobody does. And when Josephus wrote about this in his real history of Judea, in inverted commas, because it's not entirely real, he wrote all of the history of the Jewish revolt without ever mentioning King Abbaras, King Manu, or the Edessan monarchy, or Edessa itself. How could he do that? So he wrote an entire history of this, this region and never mentioned this royal family once. Glaring omissions, yeah. Glaring omission. But what he did is he mentioned them all the time. But he called them Adiabeni, King Esus, and King Monobazus. So he, what he did is, is he just subtly changed the names and for special reasons as well. So the royal family is there. They're mentioned all the time as being the leaders of the revolt. But he's changed them. So nobody now, nobody, no historian in the modern world knows the true history of Adiabeni, where it is. They keep pointing into the middle of uh, Iraq somewhere and saying it's, it's based in Arbella, which is sort of in the northern regions of Iraq up by Kurdistan. It's not. It's Edessa. And no historian today, bar myself, if I can put my hands up and blow my trumpet a little bit, knows exactly where Adiabeni is. And that's why Edessa is missing from the history of Josephus, because he's changed the name. But now we know who this royal family were, that they were involved in the Jewish revolt, they were the leaders of the Jewish revolt, and they were also the leaders of the New Testament, who we now know as Jesus Emmanuel, was actually Jesus Manu of Edessa. So we've now discovered this character in the historical record. And it doesn't actually change the story that much, except for the fact that Jesus is now a king. He was a very powerful leader in that era. He was the leader of the Jewish revolt. He was captured by the Romans after the revolt failed. And as Josephus narrates in his last book that he wrote, the leader of the revolt was summarily crucified after the revolt finished. The three leaders of the revolt were crucified in the Kidron Valley, but Josephus made a representation to the uh, governor of Jerusalem, who happened to be Titus at the time, and asked for the three leaders of the revolt to be taken down from the cross. Permission was granted. They were taken down from the cross Two of them died, and one of them survived. And the name of the person who took them down from the cross was Josephus of Arimathea? I think so. So we have a perfect correspondence between the history of this particular monarchy and the history of the New Testament. We even have here another name for Josephus, Josephus Flavius. In the Gospels, he has a starring role as Josephus of Arimathea as well, the guy that took Jesus down from the cross. 
we have the full story. And it's the same story. It just has fairy dust all over it. So, yeah, history of Judea with fairy dust. And that is the New Testament. At the end of Josephus's life, so he wrote a book called Vita, or Life. And at the end of that particular book is where he narrates this story about the three leaders of the revolt being crucified. And then he takes them down from the cross because the people petition him to take them down. And he knew them from before. They were actually friends of his from before the revolt. So he takes them down from the cross and, and two die and one survives. So it actually happened. A really interesting part, in a way, is the circumstantial evidence to show that the person who survived, obviously, was Jesus, who was the leader of the revolt. This was King, King Jesus, King Manu. And he was taken down to Alexandria to see Vespasian. Vespasian was now the emperor. This was a battle for the Roman Empire. So the goal of King Jesus was not just to take over um, Jerusalem and Judea. The goal was to take over the Roman Empire. He was one of the uh, contenders for the Roman Empire. You've got to remember that the Roman Empire was leaderless at present at that time. Nero had committed suicide in AD 67 or whatever it was. And we just had the year of four emperors when four emperors had, had come and gone. At that time, when he started the revolt, the throne of Rome was empty. And this is what he wanted to become. He wanted to become the next emperor. And that's why the big oracle in this era um, was the star prophecy. And this was the big prophecy that said that the next emperor of Rome would be a star monarch from the east. Now, who was born under the eastern star? It was Jesus himself. So the star prophecy actually referred to Jesus. But after he was defeated and crucified, they bestowed that particular oracle upon Vespasian. And that's how Vespasian became emperor of Rome. So the guy who should have been emperor of Rome was Jesus. And that's why when he was crucified, he was crucified with the purple cloak, as it says in the New Testament. And remember that the, the purple cloak was the prerogative of the emperor himself. No one else was allowed to wear a purple cloak. So the mere fact that Jesus was crucified wearing a purple cloak means that his goal was to become the emperor of Rome. This is incredible. So where does he go from there? He's brought down to Alexandria to see Vespasian. And Vespasian does a deal. And we have this from the Roman historians. So this is purely from the Roman historians now, because we drop off the end of the New Testament. And we drop off the end of Josephus' accounts of Judea as well. So we now have to rely on the uh, Roman historians. And they say that a peculiar character was brought before Vespasian, who they called Basilides. Uh, and he was supposed to be uh, a king of Egypt. And of course, you know, Jesus was of Egyptian heritage. And he was lame, and he had a dislocated shoulder, and he was blind in one eye. And just as it happens, those are the same characteristics that the Talmud says of Jesus. The Talmud says that Jesus was, was lame and blind in one eye, because these were post-crucifixion wounds, of course. This was a, a, a post-crucifixion era. So this strange character was brought before Vespasian, and it was this character who gave the oracle to Vespasian so that Vespasian could become emperor of Rome. Because Vespasian was a nobody. He wasn't royal. He, he, was a, he was a pure commoner. How could he become emperor of Rome? Well, he got the oracle from this strange guy. And this strange guy was pretty obviously King Jesus. And what happened here is a deal was done. Vespasian needed an oracle. Every Roman emperor needed an oracle to say that he was the next chosen emperor. So Jesus gave him the oracle if Vespasian showed some clemency. And the deal was that Jesus would not be killed, and neither would his immediate family. And he would be sent into exile instead. And that's exactly what happened. Vespasian went off to Rome, and he became emperor. And Jesus was sent off 
to the furthest part of the Roman Empire from Judea. And if you think about the map of early Rome, this is first century Rome, where is the furthest you can get from Judea? England. And so he was sent to a prison fortress, which they built in England at this exact same time. There was a prison fortress built in England called Fortress Diwa. And nobody knows why it was built, because it was built in a very, very strange location. It was hiding on the furthest reaches of the Roman Empire. I think I know why it was built. It was a first century Guantanamo Bay. It was a prison fortress. And we know it was a prison fortress because there was a separate element within this particular fortress that no other fortress, Roman fortress, has. A separate enclave, as it were, within the centre of this, this fortress, which had its own barracks and its own bathhouse, which no other fortress has. And, of course, the only people who would need a separate bar bathhouse would, would be the Jews, of course. And it also contains a temple. And no other fortress contains a temple, because you don't need a temple for a fortress. And it's a very peculiar temple, because it is a... And it's the only one in the whole of the Roman Empire. It is a Vesic Piscis temple. It's the sign of Pisces. It's the sign of the fish. And who is the sign of the fish? You know, what religion is the sign of the fish? Christianity. The sign of the fish was the sign of Jesus, of course, because he was the fisher of men, the first of the fisher kings. This particular temple in the sign of a fish was built in A.D. 75. This is immediately after the Jewish revolt. It is the first, as it were, Christian, although he's not Christian himself, of course, the first Nazarene Christian temple built anywhere. And it was built in England, in a prison fortress. So it seems quite obvious to me that Jesus was shipped off to um, England to live in this prison fortress and live, you know, the rest of his days in, as, as a prisoner of Rome in return for making Vespasian the emperor and giving him the uh, star oracle. So we have this strange situation where we end up with this very famous priest king on the edge of the empire in England. It just struck me as being odd that we have two kings now who are missing from the historical record. We have um, King Jesus, of course, who we've now found in the historical record. He's now an adescent king. But he was now in England because he was exiled there um, after the fall of Jerusalem. And then in England, we have another very famous king who is missing from the historical record. And that's, of course, King Arthur. And... It just struck me there was a, a similarity here. Yeah, and King Arthur, of course, is searching for the Holy Grail. Of course, intimately connected with the Holy Grail and missing from the historical record. But then when I started to do, look into the history of King Arthur, into the original books of Arthur, so this is the Vulgate Cycle, which is a massive book of some, I don't know, eight volumes or something, and it... Uh, if you can imagine books that are larger than A4, and there are eight of them, and each of them is like nearly two inches thick. <laughs> it's, it's difficult reading, put it that way. But the early books of the Vulgate Cycle are all about the first century, because, of course, the Vulgate Cycle was based on the history of Josephus of Arimathea. So it's not 6th century. We're not talking about, you know, the Dark Ages, which many people put the history of, of um, King Arthur into the Dark Ages. It's actually talking about the 1st century. It's also saying that King Arthur was directly related to the history of Jesus because the first of the round tables was the Last Supper table. So the Last Supper table was round. It was a round table with... Twelve disciples around it, of course. The second of the round tables was the round table of Josephus of Arimathea when he was in England. And again, that was a round table 
with 12 disciples around it. And then the third of the tables, and they were based one upon the other, of course, was the round table of Arthur. And again, it was a round table with the 12 knights or the 12 disciples. So the history of King Arthur is intimately based on, upon the history of first century Judea. If you go to Syria, you will find all of the tombs and all of the sarcophagi have a character leaning on the top of, or two characters, leaning on the top of the sarcophagus at the Last Supper, because this is their death, of course. So they're having the Last Supper in their death with a large chalice. It's a very sort of wide, open-brimmed chalice. That is the Last Supper, and it's a standard component of Syrian uh, sculptures for, for burials. You will see it everywhere in Syria. So that is the Last Supper. But coming back to King Arthur, we now have a similarity, a, a great similarity between the round table of King Arthur and, and, and the, um, the Last Supper table of Jesus. And also within the Vulgate cycle, you will find that a lot of the characters and a lot of the events are actually first century events. They're not sixth century at all. So we have things like a battle with King of Grips. There's this battle and the only way to, to defeat this enemy is by poisoning the water source. And there was no other water around. And, and because the water had been poisoned, they had to surrender, etc. And this was a battle that was supposed to be in Wales, and there was only one water source. You've only got to overturn any rock you like in Wales, and water will come out of it, you know. I mean, this, this just is not a Welsh story. And it seems quite obvious that King Agrips was actually King Agrippa, who was the king of Judea in the 1850s and 1860s. Reason for the water shortage is because this was a story from Judea, where obviously water is at a premium. So a lot of these events and a lot of these stories seem to be coming out of the Middle East. If we are saying now that King Arthur was Jesus, and we're going to come to this, so King Arthur is Jesus, he had lost his grail because he was now in England. And you've got to ask yourself, what is the grail? And I presume you've heard, and your listeners have probably heard as well, that the Sangharayal can be split in two portions, yes? It can be the Sangharayal, which means the Holy Grail, or it can be the Sangharayal, which is the Holy Blood. And it was deliberately done, it was deliberately separated in that, re in, in that fashion, so you could have this dual meaning to this particular title. This was in Holy Blood, Holy Grail. I don't know if you've read that particular book, but I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it. Yeah, that's a very famous book. And and everyone said, ah, yeah, but the, you know, the guys in that Holy Blood, Holy Grail made this up. You know, it's just their imaginings. Uh, no, when I went through the Vulgate cycle, it was in the Vulgate cycle. That exact same split between Sangreal and Sangr is difficult to say sometimes between Sangreal and sang Graal, it's in the Vulgate cycle. So this is like um, 14th century. So this is a very old division of words to mix the Holy Grail and the Holy Blood. And so the Holy Grail was actually the Holy Blood. It was the blood of Jesus himself. So what we're talking about is the Holy Grail was actually Mary Magdalene. She was the grail. She was the chalice. The chalice is being the womb, of course. She was the royal womb that would give birth to the next generation of royal blood. And, of course, yes, he was missing the Holy Grail because he was in England and she was in France. She was living down in Provence. No doubt under Roman decree, she was not allowed to go any further north. And he was in a prison, so there was no chance of him going further south. So yes, of course he would have been looking for the Holy Grail, because they were separated. The reason I think that this guy was Jesus is because they have the same name. If you just look at this on the surface, you'll never see why they have the same name. Again, they've been very, very 
cunning these authors in covering up the history. So the history is there, but they've been masterful in the way they've covered it up. How do we link Arthur and Jesus? Well, the first way we do it is because in the archaeology of Jerusalem and, and uh, Judea and uh, Jordan, they've uncovered uh, six synagogues. And every synagogue they um, uncover has a zodiac on the floor, which is, you know, a bit of a re revelation. And the, the rabbis keep saying they're not synagogues, and the archaeologists are saying, yes, they are, they're synagogues. So one of the key uh, fundamentals of ancient Judaism was astrology. And this ties in perfectly well with all the other things I've said about Jesus. And so here on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, just below Tiberias, there is a synagogue which has to date from the first century that has a zodiac on the floor. And more than that, it is a processional zodiac. So it has the alignment of the sun is directly in line with the intersection of Aries and Pisces. Um, uh, will your listeners be uh, familiar with uh, procession? I was going to mention it earlier, actually. Yeah, well, procession was why these synagogues had zodiacs on the floor, because they were not looking at the monthly progression of, of, of astrology. They were looking at every thousand, every 2,000 years when we change from one constellation to another under procession. You have the age of the ram, which is Moses, yes. and then you have the age of Pisces, which is Jesus. Absolutely. And then we're going into and the age changed. of Aquarius. Indeed, in 2400, right. roughly. It changed from Aries to Pisces in the first century, mm -hmm. in about AD 10. And that's why Jesus was born as a Lamb of God, but became a fisher of men. So he was born under Aries, but became Pisces. He went from the Lamb to the fish. That is why we have these zodiacs on the floor. Think of a zodiac, okay? It would be nice to be able to show listeners a, a, um, a, a picture of this, but if you can imagine a circular zodiac, you have a circular zodiac on the floor, and obviously the 12 constellations all around the outside. The sun character, the son of God, Helios, or Jesus, is in the center. So what we have is a Last Supper table. So the Last Supper table is not a table, although it could have been a table, it's a zodiac. And the 12 disciples, the 12 constellations are around the outside, and the Jesus character is in the middle. And he is the Son, the Son of God. So we're, we're talking astrology here, but he's a real person as well. So you would have had a real table with real disciples around the outside. And it's, this is an instructional technique. You say, right, you are Aries, you are Pisces, right. you are Capricorn. And so each of the disciples would have been named after a particular constellation, and they would have sat in their appropriate places with Jesus stuck in the center. By doing this, you can instruct these people, because even as you read the New Testament, you will find that a lot of these guys didn't quite understand what was going on. And poor old Jesus kept to say, what did you say? He said, why do you not understand? And he so said it, it was in a British title. accent, too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so it was a real table, and they would have sat around it and, and been those particular constellations. But this Last Supper table then became the round table of King Arthur, of course, and it would have been exactly the same. So each of the knights would have been the same as the disciples sitting around the edge as constellations of the zodiac with the Arthur character in the center. But now it gets interesting, because how did they pick out the name Arthur for Jesus? So Jesus is the character in the center. He's the son, the son of God. But that's only if you look at a zodiac, as it were, from above. So you're looking down upon the zodiac with the sun in the center and the constellations all around the outside. But if you imagine a planisphere, so now you're looking up. Now you're on the earth and you're looking upwards to the stars, you've got the constellations around the outside as before, but in the center you have the northern stars. So we have Polaris and Ursa Major, and they would be in the center of planisphere, in the center of the 
constellations. But what is Ursa Major? It's called the Great Bear, and the Great Bear is Arthur. That's what it's called. It's called Arthur. So that is how Jesus becomes Arthur. You normally have the sun in the center. But if you look upwards at the heavens, what you have in the center of the zodiac is the Great Bear, or Arthur. So it's the same person, the same name. And that's why he became called Arthur. So what we have in the Arthurian legends and the Arthurian stories is a continuation, a recognition that Jesus was a king, that he would lead his people, etc., that he was now in the north in England because, of course, you know, the Arthurian legends are based around England, not around Judea. But here is this, you know, wonderful king who will lead everyone to, to victory in the future, except now he's called Arthur. The book is Jesus, King of Edessa. You said to me yesterday, I'm glad that you're managing, Russell. And I said, no, no, I'm engrossed. <laughs> But it's going to take me a year to understand everything in this book. It's difficult, yeah. In a way, listeners should really start with Cleopatra to Christ, because that gives some of the uh, foundations for the story, the Egyptian heritage, because that's important. That the fact that they came out of Egypt is important. It's a standalone um, book, but clearly, you know, there's information yeah. that's coming before it. Then, you, again, readers need to read King Jesus before this, because that explains how Saul is Josephus. And you cannot understand the story without knowing that the biblical Saul and the historical Josephus are the same person. So that again is, is a, a great foundation for understanding the rest of it. And then you move on to Jesus, King of Odessa. Now I have the uh, honor or the luxury of having a paperback copy. You've gone paperless. I've gone paperless, you know, because as a, as a small publisher, makes so much sense for us because we don't have any of the printing problems, the, the storage, the distribution, all the rest of that, all of the accounting that goes with that, you know. So, so I've given up with paper. However, if, if you're a lover of paper books, which some people are, Adventures Unlimited are still doing the paper ones. So Adventures Unlimited, they're based in Illinois in America. They have a an enormous variety of esoteric That's uh, David Hatcher Childress's company, is it not? That's correct, yeah. And he's doing the uh, the paper versions of them at present, so he should have copies down there. So that's where not you so can far. get the book. If we need to get the Kindle, we can get it directly from you? Yeah, although uh, if, you, if you're on tablets and you're on an iPad, I would suggest using the Apple iBooks copy because iBooks are much, much better than Kindle. Kindle are getting better but their presentation of the text is is not so good the the best is the apple so I've, I've got various versions out there at present but the apple one is best the kindle one is the next best i suppose and then of course you've got the paperback version as well and the apple one of course does the videos because it has videos in the book as well that's that's another reason for going paperless of course you can have videos ralph ellis it's been an honor thank you so much for being on the program and thanks very much for inviting me.